On the, on the subject of planting trees, uh, we're going to do millions in the UK, but I was absolutely blown away. Uh, I, I, I invite everybody to follow the example of Imran Khan of Pakistan, who has pledged to plant 10 billion trees in Pakistan alone, and he's going some. And uh, I think it's very important that we in the developed world recognize our obligation to help less developed countries down this path in all these, in all these technologies. We've got the kit, but time is desperately short. Two days ago, uh, here in, in New York, uh, we had a session in which we heard from the leaders of the nations most threatened by climate change, the Marshall Islands, the Maldives, uh, Mr. President, Bangladesh, and many others. And they spoke of the hurricanes and the flooding and the fires uh, caused by the extreme meteorological conditions the world is already seeing. And the tragedy is that because of our past inaction, there are further rises in temperatures that are already baked in. And my friends, baked is the word. If we keep on the current track, then the temperatures will go up by 2.7 degrees or more by the end of the century. And never mind what that will do uh, to the ice flows, dissolving like ice in your martini here in, uh, in New York. We will see desertification, drought, crop failure, and mass movements of humanity on a scale not seen before. Not because of some unforeseen natural event or disaster, but because of us, because of what we are doing now. And our grandchildren will know that we are the culprits, and they will know that we knew, that we were warned. And they will know that it was this generation that came center stage to speak and act on behalf of them, on behalf of posterity, and that we missed our cue. And they will ask themselves what kind of people we were to be so selfish and so short-sighted. In just 40 days' time, we need the world to come to Glasgow to make the commitments necessary. And we're not talking, I'm afraid, about stopping the rise in temperatures. We can't do that. It's too late to stop the rise in temperatures. But to restrain that growth, as I say, to 1.5 degrees. And that means we need to pledge collectively to achieve carbon neutrality, net zero, by the middle of the century. And that will be an amazing moment if we can do it. Because it will mean that for the first time in centuries, humanity is no longer adding to the budget of carbon in the atmosphere. No longer thickening that invisible quilt that is warming the planet. And it's fantastic that we now have countries uh, here at the, at the UN representing 70% of the world's GDP who are committed to this net zero objective. 70% of the world's GDP, and I'm proud to say when my friend and colleague Alok, Alok Sharma, the president designate of COP26, began his his mission, his peregrinations around the world, uh, that number was only 30% of world GDP. So we're getting there, is the point I'm making. And uh, we can go further. And if we are going to stay off, uh, stave off these, uh, these hikes, these rises in temperature, we must go further. And we must go far, far, faster. We need all countries, every single one of you, to step up and commit to very substantial reductions by 2030. And I'm absolutely convinced, I passionately believe, that we can do it by making commitments in four areas. And I want you to remember them. Coal, cars, cash, and trees. Coal, cars, cash, and trees. It's very simple. I'm not one of the, those environmentalists, by the way, who takes a, a moral pleasure in excoriating humanity for its excess. I don't see the green movement as a pretext for a wholesale assault on capitalism. Far from it. The whole experience of the COVID pandemic is that the way to fix the problem is through science and innovation. The breakthroughs and the investments that are made possible by capitalism, 
and free markets. And it's through our Promethean faith in new green technology that we are cutting emissions in the, in the UK. When I was a kid, uh, we produced almost 80% of our electricity from coal. I know that some of, the, some of you here tonight rely very heavily on coal. But in the, in the UK, that percentage is now down to 2% or less, and coal will be gone altogether from our energy production by 2024. We've put in great forests of beautiful wind turbines on the drowned prairies of Doggerland between uh, Britain and Holland uh, in the North Sea. In fact, we produce so much offshore wind that I'm thinking of changing my name in honor of the god of the North Wind to Boreas Johnson. There you go. There's a, a shove in that classical illusion this time of night to see if you're, 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 you're paying attention, folks. Uh, and I know uh, that we're, at, we're ambitious in asking the developing world to end the use of coal power by, by 2040 and for the, the developed world to do so by 2030. But the experience of the UK shows that it can be done, and profitably too. And I, by the way, I want to thank very much President Xi of China for what he has just done to end China's international financing of coal. And I hope China will now go further and phase out the domestic use of coal as well. Wouldn't that be a great thing? Uh, because the experience of the UK shows that it can be done. And when I was elected Mayor of London, only a mere 13 years ago, I was desperate to encourage more electric vehicles. And we, we went around the city putting in charging points. And I'm afraid to say uh, that in those days, those charging points were pretty lonely objects and not much patronized. But today, it's totally different. And the market for electric vehicles is growing at an extraordinary pace, maybe two thirds every year. And Nissan is sufficiently confident now to invest a billion pounds in a new EV factory plus a gigafactory uh, for batteries. And that is because the government, we have set the hard deadline for the sale of new uh, hydrocarbon internal combustion engine vehicles by 2030, the most aggressive deadline in the whole of, uh, in the whole of Europe. And again, we call on the world to come together to drive this market in a low carbon uh, way, drive this market so that by 2040, there are only zero emission vehicles on sale anywhere in the world. And my point is that you can make these cuts in pollution, these massive cuts in pollution and emissions while driving jobs and growth. We've cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 44% in the last 30 years while expanding our GDP by 78%. And we will now go further by implementing one of the biggest nationally determined contributions.